Hello, my name is Robert Paul Wolf, and this is the first in an extended series of lectures on the thought of Karl Marx. Karl Marx is, in my judgment, the greatest social scientist who ever lived. But beyond that, he is a world historical figure. He was the inspiration for the two most important revolutions of the 20th century, the Bolshevik Revolution in October 1917 in Russia, and the Chinese Peasant Revolution in 1946 to 49 in China. Marx has given rise to a large number of Marxist communist factions and groups, splinter groups all over the world. There's a literature on Marx that is an ocean that washes around the entire world. Marx is, in American economics, the Lord Voldemort he whose name shall not be mentioned. But in the rest of the world, Marx is one of the great figures of all time. There's an enormous amount to say about the effect of Marx and his writings on the world. I'm not going to say any of it in these lectures, not a bit. These lectures are going to be devoted to the thought of Karl Marx himself. Now, Marx wrote a great deal. My complete set of the works of Marx and his lifetime associate and friend Friedrich Engels runs to almost 40 big thick volumes, both in the German edition, which is in my apartment in Paris, and the English edition, which I have at home and which I actually use. But by all accounts, by complete, by universal agreement, his Hauptwerk, his his most important work is this book, Capital, Das Kapital, or more, more precisely, volume one of Capital. Capital is actually six volumes long. It's an enormous book. It runs to 4,000 pages or more. And although Marx only published the first volume in his lifetime, all of the materials were prepared at the time when he published that first volume. It is a famously difficult book to read, a mystifying book. It is like nothing else that any other social scientist or student of society has ever written. It is so mysterious that that most raffiné of French Marxists, uh, Louis Althusser, actually recommended at one point that students skip the first chapter and read the rest of the book and then come back to read the first chapter later because the first chapter was so mysterious. Why is the book so mysterious? Why is it so hard to read? Well, there's a theory among a group of people who call themselves analytical Marxists, writing mostly in England and America, a theory that I like to think of as the childhood polio explanation of the book. It goes like this. When Marx was a young man, there was a particularly virulent strain of Hegelism that was going around in German-speaking universities. And Marx contracted a case of Hegelism that almost killed him. He survived, but he was intellectually crippled, so that he found it almost impossible to drag himself from the premises to the conclusion of a syllogism. And it would simply be unkind to expect him to ascend nimbly a ratio senatio polysyllogistica, like Fred Astaire tip-tapping his way up a flight of stairs. Joan Robinson, the the doyen of British Marxists, had a simpler explanation. She said he was German, and therefore he couldn't be expected to write like an Englishman. Fortunately, we know that isn't true. We know it because in 1865, when Marx was preparing to publish this book, which he published two years later, and which he anguished over endlessly, if you read the letters between Marx and Engels, you find him endlessly worrying about this and that passage and whether it was said in the right way and so forth. But in 1865, there was a meeting of the first Working, working Men's International Association in London. And a British workman named Comrade Weston made a speech in which he argued basing himself on the economic theories of David Ricardo, 
that there was no point in striking for higher wages because that would just rise, raise prices and the workers would end up no better off. So Marx decided to answer that. And being Marx, he wrote an enormously long answer, so long that it had to be given in two separate uh, meetings of the association. Marx wrote his answer in English. He delivered it in English. It was eventually published in English under the title Value, Price, and Profit. And if you go and find that little pamphlet and read it, and then read some David Ricardo from his Principles, Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, you will find that aside from the actual doctrines, the language is indistinguishable. Marx can, could write just as clearly in English as Ricardo did, and Ricardo was famously transparent and elegant in his use of English. Which raises the question, why in heaven's name did Marx write that way? I first read volume one of Capital in 1960, 58 years ago, roughly when your grandparents were going to college, if indeed they went to college. I read it rapidly because I was Go, about to teach a sophomore tutorial at Harvard in an it, interdisciplinary program called Social Studies that I had had a hand in creating. It, some of you may know, probably you don't, the name of a really great uh, political sociologist named Barrington Moore, Jr. Moore and I were co-teaching this sophomore tutorial. It was an extraordinary experience, for me at any rate. I learned a tremendous amount. I read the book rapidly and I was totally unimpressed by it, even though I came from an old socialist background. My grandfather, Barnett Wolf, was a leader of the Socialist Party in New York City in the first part of the 20th century. So I had, in effect, inherited my socialist leanings. Although, like many traits that are inherited, they skipped a generation. So that my parents were, were not socialists, but they were good Roosevelt New Deal Democrats, and I was raised that way. I didn't come back to Marx's capital for many years. Over the years, I taught Marx's writings, but it was always the early writings, so-called. The Economic Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844, which I'll talk about next time. That famous tract, The Communist Manifesto, which some of you may actually have read under the covers, if nowhere else. And, but I didn't come back to Das Kapital until 1977. By that time, I was at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, and I decided to teach a graduate seminar on classics of critical social theory. So I went back and I assigned volume one of Capital as one of the books for the semester. And I went back and I reread it. And this time, I was stunned by it. I had never read anything so brilliant in all of my life. And by then, I had written two books on the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, so I had a pretty high standard. As I read it, I had what I can only describe as, as an epiphany, what the French would call an éclaircissement. I suddenly had a vision of what Marx was doing, why he had to write the way he did, and why the book was so difficult. And I realized, I decided then and there that I would spend as much time as it took me to come to terms with this book. As the Old Testament says of Jacob, who wrestled all night with the angel and would not let him go until he blessed him. I was going to wrestle with Das Kapital and not let it go until it blessed me with some kind of understanding. So I set out on what turned out to be a 20-year uh, odyssey of struggling with the thought of of Karl Marx, an odyssey that, now, those of you who know me from other lectures or other places will know that I have an unusual and rather embarrassing habit of referring mostly to books that I myself have written. So I will just tell you that one of the results of this work was that I wrote two books about Marx. The first one was called Understanding Marx, which handled the economic theory and the mathematics. And the other was a book called Money Bags Must Be So Lucky, which handled the literary criticism and the philosophy. But it was my conviction 
that all of these aspects of Marxist thought fit together. When I was a kid, maybe kids don't do this anymore because, I don't know, my granddaughter when she was two years old was playing with an iPad, so I'm sure you don't do this anymore, but when I was a kid it was considered a big deal to be able to do this and this at the same time. It's actually rather hard to do because your hands are going in different directions. Well, that's not what Marx was doing in my judgment. He wasn't doing some literary criticism and also some economics because he was a multitasking uh, theoretician. He was a great literary uh, critic and, and writer. Edmund Wilson, the author of To the Finland Station and a great mid-20th century literary critic, described Marx as one of the greatest ironists since Jonathan Swift. And he was right about that. But I needed to figure out some way to bring all of this together. As I thought about it, I realized I was going to have to bring together four different bodies of material that were quite different from one another. First of all, there was the history of the economic history of the development of capitalism, and in particular of capitalism in England, which is what Marx studied mostly. Secondly, there was the philosophy, which in this case meant Hegel and the impact of Hegel. Third, there was the literary interpretation, the literary critical interpretation of the text itself. And fourth, there was the economic theory. Well, I, my very first job after getting my PhD in philosophy at Harvard in 1957 was teaching the history of Western Europe. Don't ask. It was weird in those days. So I figured I could handle the history. The philosophy, as Eliza Doolittle says in My Fair Lady, was mother's milk to me. That I knew I could handle. Literary criticism was a problem because I had never studied a word of literary criticism in my life. But fortunately, I was at that time married to a very distinguished literary scholar named Cynthia Griffin Wolfe. And more or less by pillow talk, I had picked up what W.S. Gilbert calls the germs of the transcendental terms. So I'd learned enough about literary criticism to be able to handle that, which brought me to the economics. Now, you may not know this, but the 1970s and 80s were an extraordinarily exciting time for the study of Karl Marx. Marx was the last of the great political economists. The other two great political economists were Adam Smith and David Ricardo. But when Marx, pub and when Marx published volume, volume one of Capital in 19, in 18, 19, I should live so long, in 1867, he was bringing to a close a century-long tradition of great economic theorizing. The very next decade, there took place what has come to be called the Triple Revolution. Menger, Walras, and Jevons transformed economic theory by introducing calculus, marginal, utility. You've all, if you've taken any economics, you've seen the supply curves intersecting with the demand curves and all the rest of that stuff that you study in economics. People went on reading Marx, but not in serious economics departments. But then in the 1970s and 1980s, around the world, a number of very gifted mathematical economists took a new look at the classical tradition of Smith, Ricardo, and Marx. And they brought to bear on it a, an econo a mathematical technique of analysis that was quite unavailable to Marx or anyone else in his time, namely linear algebra. And a number of books were published by economists in Japan, in Italy, in France, in Germany, in Hungary, in America, which transformed our understanding of classical and Marxian political economy. Now, for reasons which, if anybody's interested in, if I run out of what things to say today, I will explain at the end of the hour for reasons having to do with the difference between neoclassical economic theory and classical economic theory. The neoclassicists use calculus and the classical economists, or the, the modern students of the classical school, use linear algebra. And I studied a lot of calculus in college, but I'd never studied linear algebra. Well, fortunately, I had a sabbatical. So at the I got my grades in at the end of the fall semester in 77. And I bought myself a college linear algebra text, and I took the month of January and taught myself linear algebra. 
And then I started studying these works that have been written around the world. And I am, no, I am in these lectures going to show you how all of this weaves together. Now, along about this time, those of you who are here are probably beginning to think, well, maybe I won't come back to the next lecture if he's going to do linear algebra. And those of you who are watching this on YouTube will probably be thinking to yourselves, well, it's, I'm only two clicks away from clips from the Big Bang Theory. Maybe I ought to surf over to something else. So let me reassure you. When I studied this material, I decided that I wanted to master its elements in such a way that I could explain them, not give the proofs, but explain them, explain this work without using anything but elementary mathematics, which is what I did in my little book, Understanding Marx. And so what I'm going to do at a certain point in this, in this series of lectures is to take you through that modern reanalysis of the classical school of political economy, but not as they do it, using very sophisticated mathematics, instead using rather elementary mathematics. Well, elementary. Whenever a professor says this is elementary, what that means is everybody but advanced graduate students better bail out. So let me reassure you. Last week when I was preparing this lecture, I went online and I found the North Carolina Department of Education site. And I found there the official curriculum for everything from K through 12, kindergarten to 12th grade. And by surfing around, I discovered that the math that I'm going to do is required to be taught in North Carolina in the ninth grade. So any of you who succeeded in making it through the freshman year in high school are okay. I won't be doing anything that you didn't already learn in your freshman year in high school. Now, if you flunked your freshman year in high school, there's nothing I can do for you. There are limits to my ability to explain things. But if you made it through your freshman year in high school, you're good to go. What I'm going to try to show you in the course of these lectures, and it's going to take me a long time because it's a very complicated story, is that Marx had an integrated understanding of the nature of capitalism that required knowing about the history of the development of capitalism and the formal structure of capitalism and the mystifications of capitalism which produce the false consciousness and the ideological distortions which are characteristic of the rationalizations of capitalism. And that in order to do this, he needed a language that could capture that multi-leveled understanding in such a way that he could communicate it and implicate not only his readers but himself in what he was understanding. If I can put all of this in a phrase, I will say that my goal when I set out was to find a way of introducing the irony into the equations. And I think to some extent I have found a way to do that. And over the next nine lectures or so, that is what I will be laying out. Now, before I get any further, this is not going to be biographical about Marx, but I think it's important that you know a little something about his life. And I have on one sheet the story of Marx's life, which I will go through. You don't want to copy this down, but there are certain important turning points which it's very helpful to remember. Marx was born in 1818, which is to say, exactly 200 years ago. You will notice, by the way, the enormous outpouring in the United States of celebrations of this fact, which tells you a great deal that you might need to know about the United States, but never mind that. He was born to Heinrich and Henrietta Marx. He came from a long line of rabbis. He was Jewish, but his father had converted pro forma to Christianity because he was a lawyer and you were not permitted in those days to practice law where they lived unless you were Christian. So Marx was not raised as a Jew. He was born, by the way, in the provincial city of Trier, 
which if you look on the map or go to Google Maps, you will find is quite close to the Luxembourg border, sort of in southwest Germany, what is now southwest Germany. In 1835, when he was 17, he entered the University of Bonn. And in October of 36, he transferred to the University of Berlin, which was a big deal. He was a brilliant young man with a phenomenal education, a sort of education which in those days was not uncommon, but is nowadays almost unheard of. He read Greek easily, classical Greek. He read Latin easily. German was his native language, and he eventually became completely fluent in French and English. He read Spanish and Italian, and he read everything. The story is that he used to reread the classical uh, tragedians of ancient Greece each year just to keep his Greek fresh and fluent. When he was in Berlin, he met a group of young men. It was all, it was all men in those days, you understand. I'm not going to be politically correct and misrepresent the reality. All the students were men. He met a group who were followers of, of the philosopher Hegel, who thought of themselves as young Hegelians or left Hegelians. Hegel himself was a very conservative political theorist who thought that the kingdom of Prussia was the high point and fulfillment of the age-old unfolding of reason in the world. Sort of peculiar view. But among these young left Hegelians were people like Feuerbach and David Weiss and the, Bra the Bauer brothers, Bruno and Edgar. Aside from Feuerbach, if you've heard of him, probably you haven't heard of the rest of them. But these were young Turks. They were students. And Marx took up with them. In 1841, he completed his doctoral dissertation. I can save you all a lot of trouble. I've read the doctoral dissertation. It's not worth reading. It's an okay piece of work on the ancient atomists, but it's not something you would want to, want to spend time on. I, I will now, once again, I've done this before on camera, but I, I'm so proud of it, I will brag about this again. I'm a Kant scholar. And Kant, in 1770, produced what is called the inaugural dissertation when he became a professor at the University of Königsberg. And I've read that. And I've read Marx's doctoral dissertation. Some while ago, that egregious creature, Newt Gingrich, decided to run for the Republican nomination for the presidency. And Newt Gingrich actually has a PhD. So I went online. And I read Newt Gingrich's doctoral dissertation. <laughs> I am, I believe, the only person in the world who has read Marx's doctoral dissertation, Kant's inaugural dissertation, and Newt Gingrich's doctoral dissertation. I will leave it to you to figure out which of those was the worst. <laughs> at any rate, at any rate, in, 19, in 1842 and 3, Marx moved to Cologne and started writing for the Rheinische Zeitung, a, a, mag, a, a, a journal, a left-wing journal. And he married Jenny von Westphalen. If you know anything about Germany, you will know that a young woman named Jenny von Westphalen must come from aristocratic background. So Marx was marrying up, as it were, a fact that pleased his parents, although his mother in particular was somewhat disappointed by young Karl, and at one point said, rather famously, I wish Carl would write less about capital and make some. <laughs> At any rate, then Marx moved to Paris. He wrote for another journal there. In 1844, he met Friedrich Engels. That was a very important moment in his life, of course. Engels was the son of a German industrialist and who had a factory in Manchester, England, which he sent Friedrich Engels to manage. And Engels spent the rest of his life living in Manchester. In 1844, when Marx was hard at work on the ideas which were bubbling up in his head, he wrote something which has come to be called the Economic Philosophic Manuscripts, or sometimes the Paris Manuscripts. I'll explain more about them next week. But this was not material that he intended to publish. It was simply his way of thinking and working. And he, he would take a sheet of paper and draw 
three li two lines on it, separating it into a column called land, a column called labor, and a column called capital. And then he would write about each one of these, going sheet after sheet after sheet. And his writings in the column called labor have, are quite brilliant and have had an enormous impact on subsequent thought. And I will be talking about them next week. He, they, they eventually surfaced and were published in the 20th century, but they were not intended to be published. He, in, in 45 to 47, Marx was expelled from Paris. I'll explain why in a little bit. Europe was in turmoil. Central Europe was in turmoil politically, and the police were playing whack-a-mole. They would stomp down on a group of radical young people, and they, those people would skirt over to some other, uh, some other city, and the police there would stomp on them, and they'd squirt over to another city. And this happened to Marx until finally, in 1840, he moved from Paris, then he moved to Brussels. In 1848, Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto, the most famous political pamphlet in the history of the world. And Marx, by not surprisingly, was forced to leave Brussels. So he moved to Paris and then he moved to Cologne. Finally, a year later in 49, being harassed by the police, Marx took his family and emigrated to England. And he spent the rest of his life living in London, working ferociously hard. He was working a lot of that time in a magnificent institution called the British Museum, which is a library, not a museum. And Marx spent endless hours there reading everything he could lay his hands on about economics, English economic history, factories, and so forth. Finally, in 1867, he published Volume One of Capital. Although, as I say, he had written by that time all of the materials which appeared eventually after his death in Volumes Two and Three and then in the three volume, fourth volume called Theories of Surplus Value. And finally in 1883, Marx died in London. There's a lot more to be said about Marx, but I don't want to take the time to do it. I'll just tell you one thing, one personal thing. Uh, when I started this work, I thought I was going to write an intellectual biography of Marx. And so I read a new biography that had just come out in the 70s, written by a Princeton historian named Gerald Siegel called Marx's Fate. And by the time I had finished reading it, I decided I didn't want to write an intellectual biography of Marx because I didn't like him very much. I thought he was the greatest and most powerful and most exciting thinker I had ever read, but he didn't seem to me to be a very nice person. He was, of course, the great theorist of exploitation. He was also an exploiter. He was an exploiter of his friends from whom he cadged money. Even he was living a comfortable middle class existence. He sent his, his children to finishing schools in London and yet yeah, dance school and so forth. And yet he was cadging money from other, uh, other people in London who were supporting him who were making less money than he had. He was cadging money from Engels during his entire life. Engels was running this factory and would send him 10, 10 pound notes. At one point, Marx got a contract to write for the New York Herald. Astonishing, this is the newspaper that eventually became the Herald Tribune, on which I was a copy boy in the summer of 1952. That's another whole series of stories. But Marx was so dilatory in getting these, he was supposed to be a foreign correspondent, but he was so dilatory in getting his articles for the, for the New York Herald written that most of them ended up being written by Engels, who aside from everything else had to, had to be the, 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 the ghost writer for Marx's articles for which Marx got paid. Marx got the family made pregnant. There was a game that used to be played in that time. You had a list and you sat around. There was no television or radio, so forth, so you had to talk to each other. And people would fill this out and then compare what they'd written. Your favorite color, your favorite fruit, your favorite vegetable, your favorite characteristic in men, your favorite characteristic in women, so forth and so on. Well, there, is, there are actually two of these which have survived in Marx's hand. 
Marx identifies as his favorite characteristic in men, strength figures. And his favorite characteristic in women, weakness. He was not a nice person, so I decided not to write an intellectual biography. I decided instead to try to write this integrated interpretation of Marx's thought. Now, let me take some time to talk about the world that Marx was born into, the milieu that he was born into. It's very common among some scholars, especially when they're writing about a thinker who's a century, two centuries, a thousand years, two thousand years old, to ignore the world that the thinker lived in and to act as though the thoughts just sprang unbidden from the thinker's forehead. But that's never true. It's always the case that any thinker is situated at a certain moment in time when a certain set of problems are pressing, a certain set of facts are overwhelming. And you have to understand those as background in order to understand the thinker. And this is especially true of Marx. <laughs> Marx and Engels had a little joke that they used to tell each other in their correspondence. They would say, we got our philosophy from the Germans, we got our politics from the French, we got our economics from the English. And since they were fluent in all three languages, both of them, the letters which they wrote to each other are an extraordinary mishmash of German, French, and English. In the same sentence, they will switch from one language to another, and in, in some sentences, all three languages to show up uh, indiscriminately. So let me talk a bit about what the French like to call the problematic. I hate that word, but it's useful. The philosophical problematic, the political problematic, and the economic problematic that Marx found himself confronting when he started his work. Philosophy first. And here, I'm going to do something that may surprise you a little bit, but don't freak out. I will make it clear why. I'm going to start with the Old Testament, with the Bible. If you read the Old Testament, which I recommend to you, by the way, very strongly. I am myself, as I proclaim on my blog, an atheist. And in fact, when I was 12, year old, 12 years old, my mother said to me, Robbie, she said, you're the product of a mixed marriage. Your father's an agnostic and I'm an atheist. Now all the other little Jewish boys are going to go to Hebrew school and they're going to be bar mitzvah and they're going to get a lot of presents at a big party. And you can do that if you want to. Or, she said, if you don't want to do that, my father and I, your father and I will give you $100 and you can buy yourself some presents. So I thought about it for a bit and took the 100 bucks, which I used to buy Nady Gold's Lionel train set, which I really coveted. And that was my last engagement with organized religion. <laughs> but despite that, I am a frequent reader of the Bible, which is a truly good book. Indeed, it is a great book. Now, if you read the Bible, you find this. If you think, never mind the, the fretwork, the detail, take the long look. What the Bible presents you with is a story in a series of acts. It starts with the creation of the world and the creation of Adam and Eve. And the first stage in the history of the world is this Edenic world in which there is no sin or consciousness of sin, which is symbolized in the Bible by the fact that Adam and Eve don't wear clothes and are not ashamed, as the Bible says. Then Adam and Eve commit a sin. Sin is not eating an apple. The sin is disobeying God. And for that, they are thrown out of Eden and God lays a curse upon them. This is the original sin which then is passed on to all of all f future human beings. And just to remind you, God curses, he curses Eve before he curses Adam. He curses Eve and he says, in pain and sorrow you shall bear your young. And to Adam he says, you shall get your living in pain and sorrow in the, in the earth. 
And you call that labor, and that's why a woman's giving birth is called labor. Her, her curse is the labor of giving birth. His curse is the curse of digging in the earth and getting his, getting their, his bread by the sweat of his brow. Now you get the period of the Old Testament, the second stage, the stage of sinful human beings. This is, leads to the third stage when God makes a covenant, the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, with Abraham. And that testament or covenant is renewed with Noah, when God sets a, a rainbow in the sky as a symbol of that covenant. And then God gives his eternal word to Moses in the form of the tablets with the Ten Commandments. This is God's immortal and eternal word, his law. So this is the period in which man lives under the law. And since it is God's law, it must be fulfilled to the last jot and tittle, as Jesus says. But it is, of course, impossible for sinful human beings to do that. So they are forever falling away from the law. At first, it is said that they must all obey the law in order for man and woman to be saved. But then it is agreed that if 10, uh, if ten good men can be found, a minion in, Jew, in, in the Hebrew religion, uh, if 10 good men can be found, that will suffice, and even that is impossible. So all hopes are placed on a single man, the Messiah, who by completely fulfilling God's law will make it possible for salvation to occur. But no, 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 no earthly man can possibly fulfill God's law perfectly. So God gives his only begotten Son in the form of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect man to fulfill God's law so that salvation is possible. When God gives his son to mankind, that ends the period of the law and begins the period of faith. And that period of faith ends when the Messiah returns, when the last trump is sounded, and those who are condemned go to hell, and those who are saved go to heaven, and time itself ends. That's the Christian, the Judeo-Christian story. Why do I take time to tell this to you, aside from the fact that it's a story that I obviously like? Because that is the fundamental shape of Karl Marx's economic theory. What Hegel does is to immanentize that story. It doesn't become a transcendent story, it becomes an imminent story. Hegel interprets it as the, as the staged unfolding of reason and coming to self-knowledge of reason within the world. And Hegel has a brilliant idea. I don't actually like Hegel, I should explain. Some of you know that. I don't like him because he spent his entire life taking simple ideas and making them as complicated and incomprehensible as possible. And I think that what philosophers should do is to take complicated ideas and spend their lives making them as clear and simple as possible. But give credit where it's due. Hegel had a brilliant idea. His idea was that you could understand human history as a series of stages at each one of which the entire culture of the society of, of, of human experience was an expression of a certain stage in the unfolding of reason. And this characteristically could be described in aesthetic terms. So we became accustomed without even thinking about it to talking about medieval, the medieval period, the Renaissance period, the the Baroque period, the classical period, the romantic period, the modernist period, the postmodernist period. When Jacob Burckhardt wrote his great work, The Civilization of, of, uh, of Italy and the Renaissance, he presented the idea of Renaissance man, a man, that is to say, who in his politics, in his personal behavior, in his dress, in his manner, in every aspect of his life, embodied in an integrated way a certain creative notion of how to be. Now what Marx does 
we shall see, is to take this theory of Hegel, this story of Hegel, which is a secularization of the, of the Judeo-Christian story, and turn it on its head. And to say that it is not the aesthetic style of a period that determines and marks its character. It's the organization of the economy in a period that determines the nature of that period. So that there is such a thing as feudal law and feudal politics and feudal religion, all based on and growing out of the feudal organization of the economy. And then that is replaced by a capitalist organization of the economy which gives rise to capitalist law, capitalist politics. It isn't the politics or law that brings about the change in the economy. It's the change in the economy that brings about the politics and the law. Now when Marx was young, he knew almost nothing about economics. So that, he, but he had this brilliant idea this transforming the idealist philosophy of Hegel into a materialist philosophy, where materialist meant looking at economics rather than looking at philosophy. But he did it in a formulaic way, which was evidence of the fact that he didn't really have a firm grasp on the actual structure of the economy of, of the feudal period or the capitalist period. But he had this idea, and it turns up even in the early economic philosophic manuscripts, it turns up four years later in the Communist Manifesto, and it comes ultimately from a secularization and then transformation of the Judeo-Christian story. So there was that. That was the philosophy. The second of the, of the great things happening in Marx's day that influenced him was, of course, the French Revolution. Now, by the time Marx was a young man, Central Europe was in turmoil in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. We here in the United States make a big deal out of the American Revolution, and we talk about it endlessly and as though it were somehow a turning point in human history. But from the point of view of the Europeans, that was just a colonial foufra somewhere across the ocean that didn't make a great deal of difference. It didn't have much impact at all on real effect, on real events, that is to say, on the events of Europe. What mattered was the French Revolution. Why? Because France in the 17th and 18th centuries was far and away the richest and most powerful nation in Europe. And when Louis XIV created Versailles and brought the aristocrats to Versailles as a way of keeping, keeping control of them so that they wouldn't give them any trouble, he created a world that stunned all the rulers of, the, of, of Europe. The King of Prussia tried to imitate Versailles. The Tsar of Russia, King, the Tsar of Russia tried to imitate Versailles. Some of you may have read, you've all heard of Leo Tolstoy's great novel, War and Peace. There may even be one or two of you who've read it. It's an enormously long book. It is, I like to think, I mean, I must explain. My wife and I spent 25 years watching The Young and the Restless. So I have some feeling for long running soap operas. And War and Peace is sort of like an endless soap opera. It's just a very long book. But you probably don't know that when Tolstoy wrote it originally in Russian, the passages of it in which aristocrats are talking to one another are actually written in French. In the original novel, they're written in French because Tolstoy took it for granted that his readers would be able to understand French as well as Russian. So when Pierre, if you happen to know the novel, when Pierre meets Platon Karateyev, this peasant who is symbolic of the, pe the, the, the earth peasants of Russia, he talks Russian to him. But when Pierre is in a drawing room talking to other aristocrats, he talks French to them. That's how influential, universally influential, the France was. France was to the 17th and 18th centuries what Rome was to the Middle Ages. And French was the universal language, the language of diplomacy, in a way that Latin was the language of the Middle Ages. 
the international language of the Middle Ages. Well, when the head of France's king fell into a basket chopped off by the guillotine, a shock went through Europe, the likes of which it had never before experienced in, in its memory. And after the, after the Napoleonic Wars, which transformed the nature of warfare, by the way, throughout Central Europe, in what we now think of as Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Poland, Germany, there was a constant upheaval. The upheaval was manifested in many different ways. I mean, you may not realize it, but Grimm's fairy tales, which you read as, as children, were, were fairy tales that were collected by the Grimm brothers as an expression of their pride in their own native language and culture, as opposed to the language and culture of Versailles. The music of, of Chopin, the music of uh, Grieg, all of this, the Polonaise, is an expression of pride in Poland. All of this was going on. I mention this because 170 years later, when we read the manifesto, and Marx, you remember, if you have ever read it, if you haven't, you must. It begins, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. And you think, oh, you know, these young men, they were so naive, what did they know? But in Marx's own day, that was a perfectly plausible thing to believe because all around them, revolutions were taking place. And one of the things we will see as we get more deeply into Marx's thought is that one of the major transformations in Marx's thinking, one of the major ways in which the young Marx, as they say, is different from the mature Marx, is a way that was caused by the failure of the revolutions of 1848. It was, the failure of those revolutions led Marx in a fascinating way to completely change his understanding of feudalism and capitalism. And we'll see that in a, in a week or so when we go through that. At any rate, all of that was part of, all of that was part of the, the politics, the French politics side of what was happening when Marx came along. But far and away the most important thing that was happening was something that was getting much less dramatic attention than the philosophy of Hegel or the French Revolution, and that was the slow, centuries-long development of capitalism. As we'll see, capitalism developed first in England. Now, there were pre-capitalist developments that took place in various parts of Europe, including in the city-states of Italy. But capitalism, as we understand it, developed first in England. Indeed, when Marx was a young man writing the Communist Manifesto, cap capitalism had virtually not arrived in the German-speaking part of Central Europe. It sent, that was still a late feudal world. Indeed, capitalism was only beginning to develop in France, but it had fully matured in England. And it is therefore not surprising that the great theorists of the early capitalist period were English economists, or British economists. The Scotsman, Adam Smith, and the Englishman, David Ricardo. Smith published a, an introduction, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, as his book is called, or as it's usually just referred to, the wealth of nations in 1776, little joke in philosophy, in philosophy world. It's easy to remember the year in which he published The Wealth of Nations because it's the same year in which David Hume died, 1776. Okay, it's not much of a joke, but philosophy doesn't have many jokes, so you have to make do with what you've got. By the time Ricardo published The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, 41 years later, in 1817, English capitalism had changed dramatically. And in a week or two, I will spend some time talking about that. 
That eventually became the centerpiece of Marx's life work, of course. He became the greatest theorist of capitalism. Not, by the way, it's interesting to note, a theorist of socialism. Marx is thought of as the father of modern socialism. Of, well, that, that's a peculiar way to put it since there is no modern socialism, but the, the conceptual father of modern socialism, let us say. But Marx actually wrote almost nothing about socialism. He wrote, if you take all of Das Kapital and you throw in a manuscript that was found at his death, which is called the Grundrisse, and you throw in a couple of other things, there's 5,000 pages or more that he wrote about capitalism. You would be hard put, even if you take the Communist Manifesto and add it in, you'd be hard put to find two or three hundred pages in which he said much of anything about socialism. There are important reasons why that's so, as we shall see. He was a theorist, first and foremost, of capitalism. And his work grew out of these three influences. First, the influence of Hegel's philosophy. Second, the political influence of the French Revolution and its aftermath. And then, most importantly, the development of capitalism. It's also worth noticing that the title of capital is Das Kapital, but the subtitle is a critique of political, uh, a, a, well, a critique, this says a critical analysis. It's a critique of capitalist production. It's a critique of political economy. That is to say, it is a critique of the theorists who came before him, as much as it is a critique of the economy that those theorists were talking about. And as we will see, Marx simultaneously embraces their way of thinking and transforms it in ways that I find astonishing and brilliant. Now, where to start? I want to warn you of something. There is so much to talk about that I can't talk about it all at the same time. If you've ever seen the wonderful movie Amadeus, which is made from the Peter Schaffer play of the same name, there's a marvelous scene in which Mozart, it's about Mozart, and there's a marvelous, and well, it's really about Salieri, but that's neither here nor there. There's a marvelous scene in which Mozart is explaining to the Emperor Joseph the wonder of, of, of opera, and he explains, if you have seven or eight people who are all talking at the same time, trying to tell you something, there's nothing but cacophony. There's nothing but a jumble. You can't understand what they're saying. But if you have seven or eight people who are all singing at the same time, what they produce is beautiful music, especially when it's Mozart's music. That's what Marx did. Marx didn't simply have four or five different things that he wanted to say at the same time producing a cacophony. He had four or five things he wanted to say at the same time which produced beautiful music. But since I am not Karl Marx, all I can think to do is to take each of those things, spell it out separately until I can make it clear to you, and then weave it all together and show you how it fits together in an integrated understanding of capitalist economy and society. Now at the very, it's inevitable to ask, so, so what then, as we say where I come from, that's very nice, but what does it all come to? So it's, it's natural to ask, now that we understand Marx, was he right? Well, the simple answer to that is, he was right about some things, and he was wrong about other things. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't the voice of, of, of God crying in the wilderness. He was a social scientist. He got some things right, deep, profound, important things. He got some things wrong, important things wrong. In my very last lecture, I will try to summarize for you what I've actually written. I didn't publish it. I stopped publishing after a while. Enough was enough. But what I've written, the future of socialism. 
and I will just give you a little hint, it ain't good. But it's interesting to understand why it's not good. And the reason that it's not good is connected with some of the things Marx got wrong. Why it would be good is connected with what Marx got right. But would be is less important than will be, less exciting than will be. So this whole series of lectures will end on a downer, which I think is appropriate for America at this point in its history, since we are at a point where we may very well be confronting the, the, the danger of authoritarian fascism. I don't want to paint a rosy picture. But that's all for the future. Next week, if you want to do a little reading, take a look at the economic philosophic manuscripts. The one on ali the, the manuscript on alienated labor. It's one of the most extraordinary things that has ever been written. And you might also read the Communist Manifesto. That's always a good thing to do. <laughs> but in particular, it would be useful for next week. So with that, I will bring this lecture to a close. And I will see you all next Monday.